Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Chris said, we appreciate you getting up early uh, and joining us. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about our ionic purification system. Uh, basically, what we do is nucleic acid purification, uh, and we do it extremely well. And I'm going to talk you through the system itself, as well as the type of data that we're able to produce. So just to start off, uh, this is the purification system. Uh, it is about the width of a laptop. Uh, we understand the importance of lab space in most labs, and so uh, it's very narrow. Uh, the system is easy to use, touch screen, uh, fully automated for all of your workflows. <coughs> and every kit that you're using, depending on the sample type that you're extracting, comes with a microfluidic chip, just like you see there. Uh, as well as a set of buffers in, to enable you to run that. Uh, and I'm going to talk through all the advantages we provide, uh, starting with things like workflow, working through uh, the yield purity that we were able to achieve. So the technology is based on isotacteresis. Uh, and isotacteresis for purification is completely different than what you may be used to uh, for traditional sample prep. Uh, most of those are based on solubility, uh, whether you're using beads or columns. Uh, you're simply utilizing solubility, utilizing that chemistry to crash all of your nucleic acid onto a surface, rinse across that surface, change the chemistry one more time so you can loop back on. Uh, that generally works uh, most of the time to get you something, uh, but because it is surface-based, you actually have a couple different risks. One risk, obviously, is just losing material, getting lower yield, uh, additional risk can be uh, contaminations carrying over, but also bias. Uh, somewhat surprising to us, and I'll show you in the data, uh, because of that solubility, there are potential biases that can carry through into your sequencing data. Now, isotac freezes, we're utilizing the inherent charge on the nucleic acid. Uh, thankfully, nucleic acid is extremely highly charged, which means when we put it in an electric field, it's going to move really, really fast. Uh, the other benefit that we have is that all nucleic acid, independent of its length, whether it's DNA or RNA, all moves at about the same speed in an electric field. So whether we have 100 kb molecule or microRNA, it's all going to the same place within our system. Let me talk you through the technology just in a little bit more detail using this cartoon. Uh, the way to think of ITP is it's really based on two primary buffers. You have the what we call the leading ions. I show you that here in blue. Uh, and those are just fast ions. Um, and we simply utilize chloride. Chloride is a fantastic fast ion, and it is inherent in all of the biology as well. Second ion is the red ion we show here. That's our trailing ion, and we want to select that to be just slower than the nucleic acid, but faster than all the impurities within the system. Once we've selected those two ions, uh, we also have our own lysis buffers. We've developed all of our own lysis buffers because that enables us to free the nucleic acid for the application of interest and have it be immediately compatible with the ITP process. Then the next step, uh, the purpose of the microfluidic chip is really to line all of our buffers up in series. We want those slow trailing ions to start at the back, that's what you see in the red there. Then we want our lysate with our nucleic acid, then our faster leading ions, and then our last buffer is our extraction buffer. And our extraction buffer is simply it has our leading ions in it, but at a low ionic strength, so it's compatible with all of your downstream. Now, once you turn on the electric field, it just becomes a race. Uh, all the ions are going to move at their inherent speed uh, through the fluid. The fluid is stationary, just the ions and the molecules are moving. And the nucleic acid can never go faster than those blue ions. So it is stacking up against the back of those blue ions. However, it's always faster than the red ions. So it's speeding ahead of the red ions. And you just get this really tight ITP interface between the two of them. Now, as I said, because the nucleic acid is so highly charged, it is faster than all the impurities within the system. So you're getting purification at the same time. All those impurities are dropping back behind. So that's the cartoon version. Let me show you the video version. So this is a look into the system. All of our chips run eight samples at a time. Um, I'm showing you an example here. This is dye genomic DNA. Uh, we generally do not have any dye in the system, however, uh, it makes for a great example here. And what you can see is as this process goes along, all that nucleic acid gets compacted onto that tight ITP interface, moved across the channel into the extraction model. If we overlay our cartoon back on top of that, you can see those fast blue ions in the front, the slower red ions in the back, and the nucleic acid literally riding on that interface between the two of them 
as these slower impurities are dropping back behind. Now, lots of advantages here. Uh, because it is so different than the other extraction approaches, uh, we don't care about things like wax. So if you're doing FFP, the paraffin is very lightly charged, so it's not moving with your nucleic acid. Uh, we also, as I said, can get long molecules, short molecules, everything through that system very efficiently. Okay. So uh, one of the things I want to stress is the ease of use. Uh, we, in designing the system, it is inherently automated. Uh, because we need to apply this electric field, because we're using microlytic chip, uh, we get automation for free. What that enables us to do is provide a really simple workflow. So, uh, for example, when you're at the instruments uh, and you want to do the purification, the process itself is very straightforward. You're simply pipetting with a multi-channel pipetter. That's how you put the buffers into the chip. The instrument itself will actually prime the chip, put the buffers in the appropriate places within the channels. You then load your lysate press go, come back about an hour later, and your extracts are ready for you to move on to your next step. So uh, several kits to talk to you about today. Um, the primary ones I'm going to focus on are our FFP kits. We have FFP to pure RNA, pure DNA, uh, as well as a complete kit. The complete kit enables us from the exact same scroll uh, to get both DNA and RNA, uh, as well as our cells and tissue kits. So as we think about FFP, uh, and for those of you who have worked with FFP, you know it's a very challenging example. Uh, first and foremost to us was we wanted to develop processes that were as straightforward as possible, really, really simplify this workflow. Uh, that enables us to reduce error, reduce cost. Uh, the second thing that's obviously really important, you have no idea how much DNA or RNA you will get out of an FFP scroll. And so we want to maximize that amount. We want to ensure that you can use as little tissue as possible and yet run every assay that you need to. Uh, and so each of our kits will help you maximize the yield that will come out of those FFP samples. And then the last piece is ensuring that you're maintaining the quality of that FFP. Now, FFP is inherently damaged. We all know that. Uh, however, what we want to do is make sure that we replicate what came out of that, that school. Uh, we want to ensure that we're not creating any more damage or creating any bias. So I'm going to jump into some of the data that we have for our different kits. I'll start with our FFP to pure DNA kit. Now, as I mentioned, workflow is extremely important. Uh, what I show you on the top along the, the, there is an example workflow uh, if you're utilizing a column for an FFP DNA extraction. Lots of steps, lots of pipette steps. Uh, Almost all of this is hands-on time. Now, for the purity case, uh, the entire thing is incredibly simple. Uh, from the lysis, simply drop your scroll, uh, scrape your slide into a tube, uh, add our lysis buffer. Then we recommend utilizing a thermo mixer that enables you to incubate, apply temperature, uh, and once that has been lysed and incubated, I'll mention within that process itself, all the processes we need to happen are happening. We are deparaffinizing. Uh, we are also decrosslinking. So once the incubation is complete, your sample is ready to go on the instrument. At that point, we're simply going to the instrument, we're putting that into the microfluidic chip, hitting the button, an hour later you have all of your extracts ready to go. So very, very minimal hands-on time. Uh, I'll talk you through several examples of the type of data that we're able to pr provide for you. Uh, obviously, this is an extraction system, so the, the downstream that we'll provide is always uh, a measure off of another uh, system. So the example I'll show you here is a study we did. It's looking across 32 different FFP blocks, uh, three different tissue types, and I'm going to show you examples of amplifiable yield. We look at a DNA quality assay. Uh, we'll also look at some results from AMP constant exam. So as we said, first and foremost, we want to ensure you get maximum amount of nucleic acid out of every single block you possibly can. Uh, this is the 32 block study that I mentioned. Uh, as you can see, we're comparing in the blue bars uh, what we're able to get off the ionic system. In the red bars, that's off your standard column-based kit. Uh, and you can see consistently we're getting about three and a half times more DNA uh, out of each of these blocks than you were able to from the column-based kit. Now, the second important thing, as I mentioned, is the quality. Uh, there are different ways to measure quality because the nucleic acid is inherently degraded. 
Uh, it's a little bit challenging. Uh, in this case, what we're using is we're, we're actually utilizing a kit from Agile that enables us to check the quality. Uh, it is amplification based, and so it's actually telling you a couple different things. First, it tells you is this been, is there anything in here that is inhibiting, uh, so that you know you have a clean extract. It also tells you it's looking at a few different Amplicon links, so it's ensuring you're getting really high quality and basically the highest quality you possibly can. Uh, and then once you know those numbers, then it provides you with an estimate of how much volume to go into your assay with. What you can see here is when we looked at the same 32 blocks I showed you on the previous slide, that we consistently have higher quality material that's coming out of our extracts than what you can from the, the column based list. So, uh, first two steps of QC, we're doing great. Uh, and then the next step we can look at is well, how does this impact my sequencing data? Uh, what I'm going to show you in the next couple slides are examples where we've taken it through the sequencing assay. Uh, and then we compare against basically Coriel DNA. We want to compare against a known reference. We're effectively reverse engineering the assay. We want to know how many hits we're getting off of our DNA versus the number you would expect for that particular assay. And then we compare that versus the column. And really what we're looking for, I've sorted this in a couple different ways. The one on the left, I've sorted based on the length of the target we're trying to amplify. And what we want to see is we just want to see a flat line. It doesn't, we want to be independent of length. We want to get very, very consistent coverage. Uh, and that's what you can see for the ionic system in the blue. Just next to it, you can see the column kit. And there's some bias where at those longer targets, you're getting less coverage on those particular targets. On the right-hand side, we do the exact same analysis, except this time we're looking at the GC percent. So uh, again, for the ionic system, you can see very consistent coverage independent of the GC content. Whereas in the column kit case, you can see that on the right-hand side, as you get to that higher GC content, you're actually getting less coverage. Uh, so then it also begs the next question, how much does this bias actually matter? Uh, and so the next study we did is we looked at uh, a, set, a block where we knew that there were 26 variants. We did the exact same sequencing assay. On the top, what you can see is we're doing a comparison of one, two, or four five micron scrolls going in to the extract and then taking this material into your sequencing assay. You can see, again, examples of poor coverage. We're actually losing out on certain targets. And that is impacting your ability to make these variant calls. Uh, in the ionic case, even with a single five micron scroll, scroll, we were able to call 25 of the 26 variants. As soon as we got to two scrolls, 10 microns total, we were able to call all 26 consistently because of that consistent coverage. Uh, in the column based kit, uh, at one, very poor, you're losing out on three of those targets. Even with four, uh, you can see that, that coverage bias is actually impacting you. You're losing out on three of the 26 variants in your ability to call the, the variant calls. Okay. So that is the FFP to DNA kit. Next I'll talk about the FFP to RNA kits. Uh, first up, again, yield is really important. If we want to make sure we get the max amount of RNA we can out of those particular samples. Uh, this is an example of the mRNA yield out of uh, several different blocks. We're covering several different tissues in this case as well, ranging from breast and colon uh, to the brain. What you can see is we consistently get about twice as much RNA out from each of the FFP blocks as you can from the market meeting kit. Second important thing, uh, again, QC is really important. We have to make sure that the RNA that we've extracted for you is high quality so you can go into your assay. Uh, lots of different metrics you could potentially use for this. Our preference is to use the DB200. Uh, it at least gets you a sense of how degraded this block is that you're using. What you can see is consistently we're able to get comparable DB200s to what you can with the column kit. Uh, I do want to point out one thing, though. Uh, whenever you're using, utilizing DB200, what you're looking at is how much material you have that's greater than 200 nucleotides over the total amount. Now, the unique thing about the Puritan kit is actually we're pulling through with it all of the microRNA. This kit itself will give you the mRNA and the microRNA, uh, and so at times this number can be skewed. Uh, it can be skewed down slightly. Here's the example of looking at the same RNA kit and the amount of microRNA we're able to get out of these sets of blocks as well. Now, in this case, previously I, I compared against the market-leading mRNA kit. There are specific kits as well for the microRNA. Uh, 
This is, of course, is the microRNA kit. Uh, and what you can see is across the blocks that we show you here, uh, very consistently, we're able, we were not able to get anything, any measurable amount of microRNA out of these particular blocks using the column kit. However, we're able to get significant amounts of microRNA using the IS system. For the ones that did have a measurable amount, uh, it's about 200 times more microRNA that we're able to recover from the epic three blocks. So, uh, very efficient, as you can see, DNA, RNA. Now, one more example, one more sample type that's really important is punches. If we have customers come to us and say, I have this tiny, tiny fleck of tissue. I don't want to take scrolls, that doesn't make sense. Can I just use a punch so I can maximize the amount of tissue that will go into my extraction? Uh, we also have uh, a very slight adjustment to our protocol that enables us to take in one or two millimeter punches. Uh, I'm going to show you some additional data on the next few slides where you look at this as well. Uh, but what you can see on the left-hand side are some examples of what these punches may look like. Uh, obviously, when you do a study like this, it's quite challenging to make sure that you're getting a very consistent head-to-head. -head. Uh, those are the, the types of examples that we have where you can see about the same amount of tissue, uh, whether we're going into the ion system or whether we're going into uh, the column-based kit. So, uh, here's an example uh, for that study where we're looking at, across the different punches that we're able to, to utilize. Uh, and again, we want to see the different types of tissues, and we want to do that head-to-head -head comparison again to see how much more DNA we're able to get out. Uh, and you, as you can see, it's about three times, just under three times more DNA uh, from each of these punches. Now, similar study, also very important. Can we do the same thing with RNA? And the answer is yes. Uh, and here, you can see it, it matches the type of numbers we're able to get with the, the standard scrolls. Uh, same set of tissues, able to get about twice as much RNA out from each of these punches as you can uh, from the standard column kit. Okay, so one more FFP kit to talk to you about. Uh, we've had several customers come to us and say, from the exact same scroll, I don't want to take the next scroll, I just want to make sure I have the exact same starting scroll. Can you provide DNA and RNA from that particular scroll? Uh, so we've developed our complete purification kit. Uh, and what this actually does is we lyse that single scroll, and then we actually split the lysate. Because our yield advantage is so strong, we're actually able to split the lysate, uh, take half of it, DNA's treat, pull out the RNA, take the other half, pull out the DNA. Now, one huge advantage we have here is if you're going against the other standard kits, uh, we're able to get it, the hands-on time is significantly reduced. Uh, we actually ran this in a lab that we worked with, had them do the entire thing with uh, just our standard training. We were able to do it in about an hour and a half of hands-on time uh, to get uh, their 16 samples processed. Whereas with your other standard kits, it just takes all day. Uh, we've talked to many lab technicians who really dislike these other uh, dual purification kits because they have to invest their entire day to get their nucleic acid back out. So, as I said, uh, what we're doing, because we're splitting that lysate, we expect our yields to drop approximately in half from what I've shown you previously, but we're, we're still getting really nice yields. Uh, on the left-hand side, what I'm showing you is, again, multi-block comparison, uh, 10 micron sections going into this. Left-hand side is cubic, so total RNA. You can see we're about 20% more RNA than you're able to get from the column kit. The right-hand side, this is the amplifiable RNA, so looking at a beta active target, and again, uh, about 20% more RNA than from the standard column kit. DNA, uh, very similar. So uh, again, the, we're taking the exact same section, we're splitting it. I showed you the RNA portion for that exact same one. The DNA portion, uh, we're about comparable in terms of the amount of DNA that we can get versus the column kit. Uh, Left-hand side, again, is qubit, so total, and the right-hand side is the amplifiable. Now, this protocol itself, uh, we're incubating for about an hour. Uh, what we have found is if you want to up the amount of DNA that you get out, uh, that's generally a cross-linking question. And so the way to maximize the amount of DNA that you get out from these extractions is to actually take your DNA, incubate that overnight, fully remove those cross-links. Once you do that, what you find is for the exact same samples, you can get about 20% more DNA than you can with a column kit. From an amplifiability perspective, because we've removed so many of those cross-links, uh, we're about two and a half times more amplifiable DNA, uh, so considerably better from that perspective. 
So one more kit to talk to you about uh, is our tissue to cure DNA kit. Uh, we think of this as being complementary to the, the FMP that I just showed you previously. Very similar to what you've seen before. Uh, standard chip, standard set of uh, buffers that will come with it. Very simple workflow, similar to the workflows that I showed you previously. Drop your tissue in, incubate on a thermal mixer, take it to the instrument, uh, and then extract. Uh, and again, looking across many, many different tissue types, we have uh, tissues that are high yielding, meaning they have lots of DNA that will come out. We have low yielding tissues, so just the tissue types that will have low amounts. Uh, and here, uh, I'm showing you the cubit yield, but I'm showing you in a slightly different way. Those of you that work with tissue, you know uh, the best metric is the mass of DNA that you get out versus the mass of tissue that you put in. So that's the way I scaled here. Uh, and what you can see in those blue bars is consistently the ion system is able to get much, much higher yields of DNA out from these samples. Now, the other examples I'm showing against here, which we have two different kits that we've compared against. Uh, and for one of those kits, uh, kit B here, we actually have two different pollution volumes to recommend. You're sort of making the trade off of do I want as high a concentration as I can get, or do I want to maximize the amount of DNA that I can get back off that column? Uh, we've made all of this standard comparisons. You can see, independent of which one we compare against, we're still getting you considerably more. DNA uh, than you can with any of the columns. And if we look at that DNA in a slightly different way, so what we're trying to do is sort of hit that sweet spot in terms of the amount of input tissue. So we're spanning from uh, about a milligram to 10 milligrams of tissue going in. And what you can see is at about a milligram, considerably more DNA than you can get from those column kits. As you scale all the way up to 10, we stay linear. Uh, we're not losing as we continue to put more tissue in. However, you can see with the column kits, uh, that slope is not one. Uh, that's not where you want to be. Uh, and so we have really good consistency in our extraction as well. Now, really what does this mean? It's the same thing as with the FMP. You want to make sure that you're maximizing your yields so that you're certain that you will pass your QC, which means you will have higher certainty than when you go into your sequencing or other downstream assay, that you will have success. And that's what we, we consistently see because of the high yields we're able to generate. So just to summarize, uh, we have the, the ionic system, uh, very easy to use, uh, different kits that we can provide you depending on the sample types you're using, consistently higher yields, uh, consistently really good quality, ensuring that we're replicating uh, the starting material. Uh, and it does matter. Uh, ensuring that you have as much material as possible, that you're not creating any sort of bias in your extraction, does play out as you go into your sequence. So with that, I will transition to Dr. Hume. Uh, let him continue the presentation. I would like to thank the Christian for inviting me to attend this workshop. And thank Brink um, for this very nice introduction of this uh, powerful technique. And uh, I'm just going to give a few real, ex real life examples of M. Nansen service. I'm a co director of Unified Sustainable Extraction Facility at M. Nansen. Uh, before I go to details of the service request, just a few minutes of uh, M. Nansen and our customer base. Uh, M. Nansen is the largest skin hospital in the world uh, with about uh, 22,000 employees, and uh, we have uh, almost 23,000 surgeries every year and a lot of uh, sources for tissues. And uh, uh, MDS annually spend almost one billion, more than one billion dollars on research. And uh, we have, I said, 22,000 employees and about 1,800 faculties who are conducting uh, cutting edge clinical, translational, and basic research. And some of these uh, faculties, they don't have wet lab. And also, some faculties may prefer standardized uh, tissue extraction, so they request us to provide a high quality service for DNR extraction for downstream applications. And physically, the MDS is large campus. We have over 30 buildings around uh, North, Mid, and South campus with uh, 15 million square feet. And we have shuttle bus around uh, these buildings. And in addition to MDS, we also have uh, customers from other Texas Medical Center. Institutions, this is the largest medical complex in the world with 63 member institutions 
in this uh, area of uh, about 1,300 uh, acres. This is the fifth largest business district in the world, in the U.S. And uh, with 15 million uh, square feet of uh, space. And uh, actually, currently, there are almost 3 billion construction still undergoing. So everything tax is bigger. So we have more than 100,000 employees. And that is largest. And also, that largest hospital, children's hospital, is largest in the world. So tax medical center. It's getting bigger and bigger. And actually, the most exciting new development in Texas Medical Center is the Mexican and campus. And uh, there's a huge parking lot next to our middle campus. And uh, a, a new campus is uh, just built by last year. This is called TMC3. This is the render of TMC3 after 10 years. And this is a world class uh, new campus, about 6, six million square feet. And with industrial, academia, buildings, uh, residence hall, hotel, conference center, and also a summer helix garden. It's called helix garden. That uh, could be uh, five big public parks. With, uh, each park is about uh, one football field. So it's a lot of space and uh, uh, grass and fields and also uh, cafe restaurants, retail spaces. This will be iconic uh, public park for Houston. So at the end of Houston, will be very fair, very gorgeous uh, uh, camp campus of TMC3. We call TMC3 because 3 means the third coast. Uh, I guess that we say Houston is the third coast of the life science uh, in addition to the Pacific and the Atlantic coast of Boston and San Diego area. So let's go back to coal. And NS is so large, and we have 36 coal facilities in NS. So some of these are CCST, is supported uh, uh, by NCI, and some of most of these are institutional supported by NES. So every year, NES uh, have two rounds of solicitation for capital equipment. So the core get priority. So that's why we got this uh, fusion uh, system. Actually, shortly after the month of this fusion system in 2019, I think it's November. And December, I guess we did this capital request request and we got approved uh, in, in March, just, just before the pandemic. Then we delayed a few months and we got the equipment for uh, in July 2020 and we started service. And before that, we had demo system. I think the uh, demo system worked well and we got this equipment. And this is uh, our core facility and the left side is the uh, external link and the middle is the in in internal link. And this is the uh, fusion link. Actually, we were the first institutional core to provide service using fusion system. And, uh, as I said, we first had a demo system, then we purchased in uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. And after we purchased, we were happy with it. And MDS right now have four such equipments, three by other uh, departments and individual collaborators and individual investigators. And we are in the process of buying another one. So by next month, MDS will have five fusion systems. I think it's the single most uh, fusion system in the world in any single institution. And this is just our price and to highlight the uh, the fusion system as I uh, as our instruments. And now I go back to a few uh, small projects or small and large projects uh, to demonstrate the powerfulness of these techniques. Uh, and I will highlight uh, I will not disclose the purpose of this study just purely from technical points. And uh, I will not also not disclose the PI's name because uh, this is really pure from the R and D quality and the downstream. Uh, application quality. So this is the very first project we worked with Turgeon. Basically, uh, one, of the, one of our faculty he gen uh, generously gave us a few uh, samples from various sources of uh, lead, bone marrow, liver, and skin. We, we already did uh, column-based extraction before, and we had some difficulties, uh, some of the yield very low. So we said maybe we can try this uh, Turgeon techniques. So this is just uh, shows this, uh, we put the buffer in and the light in. And some of them have uh, red flags, uh, number five, one and five. And uh, some of them have white field forming the light in uh, uh, two. But nevertheless, we got very good results of this uh, uh, extraction, it's DNA extraction. And this is just, uh, for those three tubes, we can do uh, triple lysis. So basically, if you can increase your thing, instead of just one lysis, you can add, I mean, do three times the lysis, then you can increase the yield of this DNA. 
And this is just a, a comparison as the industry before for other samples, and we compare this trojan uh, system with our previous column based method. And for seven out of the eight samples, we get significant more uh, yield of DNA than this column based method. And some of the column based, we didn't have anything uh, in the uh, very far before, and we got quite good uh, yield from the trojan system. And this is a second project. And this quite advice is a very tiny head and neck, head and neck uh, surface cell carcinoma samples uh, biopsy. And uh, you have uh, different sizes, uh, some are very small, and also the different uh, tumor cellularity. And the green bar here shows some of 25%, some of 60% of different cellular uh, tumor component. And uh, so they always start uh, small. So we first pick seven, uh, seven different sizes of this. Uh, Tissues, uh, and you can see the tumor area, the root ranges from seven uh, and then square to uh, 250. So, this uh, size is totally different, and also this uh, tumor cellularity is different. So, basically, the tissue still uh, FHG depends on the tissue quality and the size, so each tissue is different. So, you don't expect to get 100% that everyone is successful, but anyway, uh, we just uh, based on this tumor area, we can uh, advise our customers with how many. How many uh, slides you need to get reasonable uh, amount, and some of them don't have enough, so they have to make do with a uh, limited amount. So that's why uh, when we ask them for slides, they give us uh, whatever they have, and then we we always get uh, I mean based on our advice, we get a reasonable I mean acceptable amount of total DNA and total RNA, and uh, quality for DNA of course DNA generally is very good, and for RNA you see. That the DV uh, 200 is kind of uh, low because it's sometimes it's degraded and also the cis cisfusion is kind of different from other systems then you can have everything RNA, small RNA, micro RNA. So the DV 200, uh, normally when you send to the advanced, I mean the genomic code, they advise that you have to send the DV 200 more than 30%. But in our experience, anything above 10% will work. So this, all this, like uh, some of the DV 200 is 7.8%. And percent, then they send this to the sequencing code, and uh, yeah, they, 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 this is just the results for, uh, for the whole exome sequence. And you can see the the coverage, every coverage of five hundred, and uh, the ninety nine percent more than thirty eight. So the whole exome sequence certainly works very well, as expected. And for the RNA, RNA seq they use the pump seq. This is a seq by whole transcript. Transcriptome sequencing, uh, and it also works well. They, they, they fix for the for the two samples, and for the is pre treatment, and for the is after treatment, anyway. and they correlate with another HTGH seq. This is a uh, custom uh, HTGH seq. It's a uh, uh, target sequence uh, RNA seq. So that's they did before, uh, not with this uh, trojan purified RNA. They use the uh, direct uh, FAP tissue. So basically, the benchmark is uh, RNA seq with the previous. Uh, HTG. So basically, if they, if they have two pieces of HTG, I mean, the correlation is ranging from 4 to uh, 30% to 60%, and when they benchmark RNC to children, RNA with their HTG with other technique, and the uh, correlation is similar to the uh, duplicate HTG. Basically, it means this, this RNC works well and in terms of gene expression level. So, uh, this is just for examples of this correlation of these two techniques. The uh, quantic and uh, HTG. HTG was used other method, and quantic was uh, using trojan to provide RNA. So the correlation is reasonable and as expected. And also, they, they, they use, because this is an FP tissue RNA, is degraded. So they, they benchmark to these uh, fresh culture cell lines uh, by the uh, gene expression uh, read, read. So uh, this is fresh cell lines. They use this is was using Pfizer ISP to provide that this RNA is very pure and very high I mean, quality. And when they use FFP tissue, basically you have a kind of comparable coding of these uh, uh, genes. This is 17, the medium of 17,000 genes uh, detected for sample from the FFP tissue. For, for fresh culture cell, you have uh, 18, so it's very comparable. So it means that if all this FFP uh, RNA, even if they have a kind of DV200, is around 
can do certain things with it. Very good RNA sequence data. Uh, the third project is a client lifestyle project. This basically is a uh, breast cancer project. It's a six day four of machine FAT biopsies, and uh, they, they have a uh, He's standing to mark this uh, tumor area and uh, tumor cellularity, and also then they, we will use the RNA replication uh, using a fusion phase, and they, then they, they, the customer then is uh, uh, to the true seek RNA access. It's a whole exon, uh, uh, whole exon RNA sequence, and uh, then it is uh, safe to do this. Uh, this is a process. These just examples of these uh, uh, tissues. And uh, about 40% of our primary breast breast tissue, uh, breast tumor, and you can see the tumor cellularity ranges from 5% to 8%. Uh, you can see the tumor portion and uh, from small to large, and also this is kind of a large, uh, larger than the actual. And some of the tissue are very small, but it's uh, very heterogeneous. And this is a uh, bone uh, tissues uh, of this. I mean, about 40% of the. Uh, advanced breast cancer the metastasis to the bone, so this is just bone, different bone, and you, again you can see the heterogeneous of the tissue portion, cellular from 10% to 70%. And we have some other tissues like liver, lung metastasis, and also different ovary, peritoneum, and brain, they're just all breast cancer metastasis tumor tissues, some very small. And then we, uh, this is just RNA quality. We extract from them. This batch of tissues actually uh, have a better storage, I guess. I mean, their DV200 is, is much better than previous one. So you can see the DV200 uh, most of them is about 30, it's a very high quality. And uh, the yield is kind of, uh, is, uh, most of them are acceptable for this uh, downstream sequencing. And uh, you can get as high as uh, one or two micrograms, anywhere from 500 nanograms to uh, two micrograms. And this is the data, uh, they, I mean, RNA seq data. This RNA access is a whole uh, exon sequence. Basically, they use two different alignment tools. They can get 80% of them, they can get them very good leads. Uh, I mean, the highest uh, is 150 million leads. You have, that's uh, you have very high the RNA amount, you get more leads. And but 80%, they, I mean, about this 5 million uh, is acceptable. So they get 80% of very good RNA. Uh, access the I mean, exon data. So, uh, the customer are very happy. I mean, they don't expect 100 percent some tissue is small, some tissues you don't get enough. But anyway, 80% is uh, well accepted uh, for our customer and this is just a little bit of biological uh, data basically. They, they send this uh table as batches, batches one to five because they don't say uh, they don't do each sequence on the same day or the same batch. Anyway, uh, when they do this uh, clustering using the uh, the samples, because you see many of them are breast cancer, many are liver, can, uh, liver, liver site or the bone site. You can see basically the, express, the correlation, uh, the correlation between different tissues is, is by this uh, tumor of sites, not by the batch. So the batch didn't affect this uh, uh, gene expression coding, and most of this is by, so biologically. I mean, if you are from breast tissue, the correlation is higher than the other tissue. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, as it's expected, it's just the quality of the RNA. Uh, exon seek. Uh, this is uh, our most recent project, and uh, this is the, uh, the largest project we have we are doing right now, and we just completed. Basically, our customer uh, he had uh, almost two hundred of these uh, FAB cards. This is not on slides. This is on plastic uh, sheets. So basically, it's an international collaboration from different countries. The the all the, the FABs on this uh, kind of a paper card. I mean, Plastic sheets, then they give us these uh, tissues. Then we have they mark the tumor region and we cut off the tumor and we also need to cut off the uh, adjacent normal and also the distant normal tissue. So basically, we have more than almost 1,000 uh, sample processing from these 200 cards. So uh, we, uh, we first did eight testing of this RNA, and uh, you can see uh, basically it's a very good quality uh, for this test. We have both normal and tumor, and uh, concentration and quantity and DV. As you said, DV 200 is kind of along a certain thing, and the lowest is 15, but they, could, they, they got very good uh, sequence results. And uh, 
this is just uh, this, uh, this is uh, in the total I think this is just uh, the uh, different the region and of this uh, let's see Sorry. yeah this I call it I guess this is the uh, the 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 place is Q three less than you know, call it the error rate of less than point one percent so basically it's very high about certain is very high and uh, the yield is uh, 16 million, uh, 16 million, and uh, 30 million, million for the score. So the five, that's basically it's very high quality uh, of total RNA seed. And the, the customer are very happy with this sequence. So we, we have done all these uh, almost 1,000 samples, and this just shows the uh, different electron weight and the uh, intronic intergenic in total RNA seed. So, so to summarize my talk, and uh, we have been pretty I lot. I found it an uh, highly computer system for the TBNRI construction service and processed a few thousand of samples. And the DNRI extracted by Purigen system have been successfully used for downstream applications, including various next gen sequencing platforms. And this uh, Purigen uh, system gradually reduced hands on time and uh, increased throughput and increased uh, our service request, and our customers are very happy. And I said, MES already have almost next month we have five such systems and uh, we look forward to more collaboration with Thank you.